welcome to our excursion. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Falkowski. I'm the Education Coordinator at Rookery Bay Research Reserve in Naples, Florida. We know that you're joining from all over the country and maybe even all over the world. And I wanted to give you a few housekeeping things to let you know that in this webinar, we're not able to see you, but you can see and hear us but we know that you're out there. So we want you to use the chat box at the bottom if you'd like to communicate with the behind the scenes panel. If you have questions about um, technical stuff or customer service type things. And if you have a question for any of the staff that you're about to meet, you can put it in the Q and A box and we'll have a question answer period at the end. Something really cool about the Q and A box is you can actually upvote. That means you put the thumbs up symbol next to someone else's question because you would like to hear the answer too. And that will help us prioritize in case we get so many questions that we don't have time to answer them all at the end. So a little bit about what we're doing today. It, this is an excursion live from the field and you will be meeting people live in the field. And our topic today is native biodiversity. So here on the screen, you'll see the education team. We will be featured throughout as well as some other special guests. And now a little bit about who we are. So we are part of the National Estuarine Research Reserve System. This is a network of 29 sites, but we're about to grow to be three more. So you can see here on the map that we're gonna be welcoming Connecticut and Louisiana soon. Every reserve has a focus on education and research and stewardship. And we're located all the way in the south part of Florida on the western edge of the Everglades on the Gulf of Mexico. And more locally, we are part of the Florida Department of Environmental Protection and we are in the Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection. And together we protect over 4 million acres throughout Florida. So really important group and I know lots of you are joining from DEP today, so thanks for being out there. And next we have a map of Rookery Bay specifically. So located in Southwest Florida, Rookery Bay manages 110,000 acres and that's everything within this yellow outline. So I am located right now at the yellow square, which is the Environmental Learning Center. And I'm joined by my colleague, Dita, who's also in the Environmental Learning Center. And she's gonna tell you a little bit about what to expect. So don't forget to enter those things into the chat box and uh, for me and in the Q&A box for the panelists and I will be monitoring. So I'll see you in a little bit. Good morning, everyone. So as Sarah said, this is our map boundary of Rookery Bay Reserve and we manage a lot of land, 110,000 acres. And in this map, you can see quite a bit of it is submerged land from, you know, near shore habitats to our estuary, our mangrove areas, but also there's a variety of uplands too that are in um, kept found within our boundaries. And we have a lot of different type, uh, bio, different types of animals found throughout the reserve. And today we're hoping to take you kind of through a journey and kind of show you the wide variety of animals found here. And so to do this, we are actually gonna be doing something a little crazy. We're gonna have two field cameras going on. First, we are going to head down to the blue star that is down in the Cape Romano complex. And we're gonna be learning a little bit about some of our sea turtles we have in the area. Then we are going to have a presentation about the power of wildlife cameras and how we can use those to monitor a variety of animals found in the reserve in different habitats. And then we'll end up at this green star looking at some of the different plants we have in the reserve and some of the techniques we use to monitor them. So with that, let's get out into the field. How's my video and sound? Are we here? Are we together? You are good to go. Looks and sounds great. Wish we were there. Awesome. Well, great. Let's make sure we're spotlighted so we can get a good view on our screen. Yep, you're full screen. All right. So. Um, my name is Janine Windsor. I'm part of the amazing education team here at Rookery Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve, and I am 
in the blue star um, in this beautiful place called Dickman's Point. And I'm joined with another great staff member here to just give you all a sneak peek at um, our sea turtle monitoring program and uh, what's going on this island this time of year. Hey everybody, my name is Sarah Norris and I am on the research team here at Rookery Bay Reserve where one of my responsibilities is to manage the Cape Romano sea turtle program. So uh, essentially what that entails, you know, between staff, interns and volunteers, we come out to the Cape Romano complex uh, from about the dome homes all the way to Caxambus Pass, looking for any sort of evidence of sea turtle nesting uh, from May through October. So these first few months of the season, we've got some busy uh, nesting females on our beaches. So when we see evidence of a nest, we go ahead and locate those eggs and cage them uh, with this protective material here. So, uh, you know, fingers crossed that everything goes well. And about 60 days later, those eggs will hatch and we'll see evidence of a hatch uh, when we come out uh, by a big depression in the middle of the cage area. After that, we then excavate the nest, meaning we pull everything out and do a count and an inventory, you know, how many hatch, didn't hatch and so forth. And that information gets sent up to FWC at the end of the season. So in the meantime, while the eggs are incubating, we are keeping track of what's going on with the nest. So in this particular scenario, uh, this nest was overwashed by our super moon high tide the last Ooh. day or two. So I don't know if you can really see here, but the sand yeah. um, definitely is a little bit more compact and wet. And these sea turtle nests can tolerate that, you know, um, they can handle being a little bit overwashed. The success may end up being a little bit lower because of that, uh, but we won't know until uh, the nest hatches out to really get a good handle on the success. So um, other nests that, you know, may do a little bit better if they're further from the waterline might be like this one up here. So this nesting female crawled a bit further up the beach, nice, high and dry. So. Um, these are just a couple examples of what we're seeing uh, when we're out. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any evidence of new activity today at this area, but if you're out on the beach, you know, look for those tractor tire like tracks. Um, and that's usually a pretty good indicator that, you know, a turtle has come up the night before. Uh, so if you're interested in following along with us this season, um, you can go to the website and learn a little bit more about our program and then click the link uh, that has real-time data. So we collect data um, uh, remotely on an iPad. So anytime we record new activity, it will refresh on that page on the website. So you can see what we're doing real-time every day. That is awesome. I think our colleagues are gonna be uh, putting that link in the chat for everybody. So yeah, this is um, just the beginning as Sarah said and we're looking forward to a hopefully a busy turtle season. Yep, absolutely. So, you know, we'll have nesting from now through about beginning of August and all those nests laid at the tail end will hatch through September and October. Is this the only island that they'll be on? Or, you know, there was the, the map, it, there was a lot of barrier islands. Yeah, yeah. so the program um, that I manage is, you know, Cape Romano Complex. So those set of islands just south of Marco, but turtles nest uh, all over you know, the reserve and other islands and other areas, as well as the entirety of Collier County, the Southwest coast of Florida and Florida as a whole. So there are people just like us all over the state, along with other states across the country uh, that are performing similar uh, monitoring efforts this time of year. Fantastic. Well, thanks Sarah for letting us uh, take a peek today and interrupting the awesome monitoring down here. We're gonna send it back to the uh, Environmental Learning Center with Sarah and Dita and see what else is cooking. All right, so that was a little brief introduction into our sea turtles. You will be probably if you're down here in Southwest Florida or anywhere in Florida, start seeing more of those nests popping up. And so uh, it's always kind of fun to keep an eye if you get a chance to look at that turtle uh, dashboard to see how our numbers are going this summer. All right, now we're gonna move into wildlife cameras. And so we are gonna be joined by my uh, coworker, Steve, and he's gonna be showing you some camera traps that are found throughout the reserve.
Hello, my name's Steve. I work with uh, the amazing resource management team. And uh, I'm just gonna tell you a little about some of our camera trap surveys that we're using. Um, we specifically are using Browning and Reconyx cameras right now. Um, there's a Browning you can see strapped around the tree there. And then I have two that are on posts there. We got different mounts that you can use out in the wild. Um, and they're an excellent management tool. And uh, we used to use the wildlife cameras with um, photographs. So you'd have to go get them developed and that was kind of a pain. Then they had the di digital cameras, which was a little better. And then now the computer chip cameras, which uh, are great out of the best. Um, next, next slide. So we used to rely on sighting observations from different people and, um, and photographs. And then we started getting into using the wildlife cameras back in about the, the early 2000s. We used to use track surveys for uh, coyotes. Um, you would dig up an area about a meter square and sift all the, the sand so it's nice and smooth and put a scent disc in there and then try to uh, identify the tracks. And um, so that was kind of, if the tracks got a little worn out or if um, it rained, it was, and, or if it's like um, a fox or a coyote, those tracks are kind of hard to tell the difference by. So the wildlife cameras made it excellent to uh, verify what, what was in the station. Um, next. So this is, we use them on our invasive hog program too. And this is a, a female right here and a female hog and a, a pregnant female hog. And she can reach sexual maturity in about a year. And they have litters on the average about four to six, but they can have up to 12 animals. And she can go into heat every 18 to 24 days. So within a couple of years, you can have a lot of hogs running around and um, they route out the landscape. They, um, they make a foothold for exotic vegetation and they disturb the natural vegetation and, and it intensifies the exotic vegetation spread, which reduces the natural habitat that the, um, plant, the animals and plants. So it's a spiraling effect. So we try to do that. And uh, usually the cages, um, you catch the young and the dumb and the old savvy ones there, they won't go near the cage, you know? So you got to use other methods to get them. So we've got them on the wildlife cameras too. Next. So we also work and sometimes in cooperation with um, FWC, and, um, and some of their panther tracking surveys when the cats are on Rookery Bay lands. And um, so this is down in Shell Island in one of the cameras. And um, you can see that there's, we got some deer, we got some family raccoons. So it's a good way to kind of see what kind of wildlife you get in a specific area. Next. And then you, you had uh, some photos, Steve, that are during the day and at night. How is it deciding to take photos? Well, some of the cameras you can switch on day only or night only, and and um, and usually the cameras will will do night and day. They have an infrared sensor that detects um, heat from the animal and a motion sensor. But um, as I'll explain later, um, camera placement is kind of uh, best because um, if leaves move and stuff like that, the camera triggers so you can get hundreds of false triggers on your cameras. So, um, oh no. Next. So this is back down in Shell Island Road too. And um, this is uh, up in the top right, there's a mature buck here. And I'm guessing because it was in a couple days later, 
and on this other one down here, well, the two young bucks were fighting and uh, I didn't get the top of them to see if the rack matched, but um, I know he was a dominant buck. And um, when I was down there, I could hear the, the snort. Have you ever heard a um, deer, a buck deer oh. snort in the, in the woods? Yeah, it's like it's a real loud snorting noise. Um, it's very distinctive. You'll never forget it. Almost like an alligator growl. If you ever heard an alligator growl out in the swamp, you never oh. forget that. <laughs> Next. So we got we got camera traps on some of our um, terrapin turtle nests. Um, it's a pretty much a sand mound, and a lot of animals utilize those mounds out in the wild. So we have a couple of bobcats here sniffing on the mound, sniffing for eggs. And so you'll get the, the animals that are actually nesting in the sand. You'll get the predators that are looking for the eggs and you'll get the scavengers that come in afterwards and eat up the egg shells and the insects and stuff that are attracted to that. Next. So we also get a large amount of birds, different species of birds. And uh, so the, on the left there, we got a great blue heron and uh, they'll come up and uh, they'll try to dig up the turtle eggs too and, and hunt for the turtle eggs. And in the top right, we got a limpkin and I think he's just scavenging around from the insects and the bugs and the grubs that are on the nest. And the bottom, we got a red shouldered hawk which was caught in one of the nests too. And uh, we've even had wild turkey pigeon on, one, on some of the nests too. Next. We've, we've had bear too. Bear actually have dug up nests with turtle eggs in it and um, rolled around in all the egg mess and got all the smell all over them. You're almost like your dog. You've ever had your dog roll in something nasty and come home all smelly? Well, the bear did that and he, he liked it. And he was laying on the nest for about two hours. <laughs> Next. So we also use wildlife cameras for surveillance too. So this is one of our surveillance cameras on our, our equipment property. And what do we get? We got a panther. And what we found out that this panther comes back like every year in the same area. So panthers are a creature of habit. They, they have a specific range. And if you've seen one at a specific month, um, it'd be good that you might see him again when he comes back through that area again. So next. So this is another panther that was on one of the, the terrapin nests on the sand mounds. And um, this animal was on the nest for about two hours too, sleeping in the sand, rolling in the sand. He was looking right into the camera. I got some beautiful panther shots, but I didn't want to bore you with the pretty cool little panther shots. But uh, that's a nice, young, healthy little panther that was on. Um, lounging around on a tarp and turtle nest. Very comfortable. Next. And every now and then you get really lucky. And uh, this is a crocodile come up to the nest and was chasing a soft shell turtle. And that's like, um, you don't ever, ever actually see that without a, a wildlife camera. So, and I got like several other shots because it was like a second apart and he was chasing it all the way down to the water. He was like about an inch away from jumping on it and the turtle got into the water and out of there in the nick of time. So it was, it was pretty, pretty interesting to see that. Wow. Next. And we have our fuzzy little otters. They come up there too. And, uh, They'll try to eat the eggs and scavenge what's left on the ground. And uh, they'll leave some poop and other animals come up and they smell it. So um, it's like a scent station. If you put a camera there, you'll get 
all kinds of animals stopping up there and checking out what was on the mound. Next. So I just wanted to talk a little about the wildlife cameras. And um, if anybody has an opportunity, they should get one to put in their backyard or the woods by their house. Um, they really, they really need to, to check out to see what's actually walking around your neighborhood. But um, it's best to try to attach them on some sort of uh, camouflaged area that kind of blends in with the with the background. This one on the left is in there, pretty good camouflaged. You got to make sure it's over the vegetation. Otherwise, every time the vegetation moves, it'll trigger the camera. So sometimes in different places, wherever you're aiming at, you will you will get a lot of false triggers in your, your data set, but um, you just got to erase them all them there. And this is another shot of a wide open space here. And unfortunately, you do get a lot of um, false triggers associated with that, but um, it's worth it because that's where I got the deer fighting was right in this open space here. So... Um, that's, that's, you know, part of the game really, I guess. Um, well, thank you so much, Steve. That was an amazing variety of animals that you've captured in the reserve. Well, thank you. It was my pleasure talking to you and if, um, I'll answer anybody's questions afterwards if they like. Thank you very much for having me. Bye -bye. Yeah, perfect. And since you ended with all this beautiful vegetation, I think we're going to keep Moving on back into the field. So plant cam, if you want to get your camera up, I'll get you all situated. All right. Can everyone see and hear me? Yep, wish we were there. Oh man, I wish you all were here too. It is beautiful out here this morning. My name is Morgan and I'm also on the awesome education team here at Rickery Bay Research Reserve. And I am out here in the upland scrub. You are getting the excursion trifecta today. We saw the turtles, we saw the wildlife cameras, and now we are gonna focus on some native vegetation that is key to this very important habitat. And hey, I can't do it justice. I'm out here with a stewardship specialist, Jared. He's gonna introduce himself and walk us through this beautiful place. Hello everyone. Uh, as Morgan said, my name is Jared Franklin and I'm a member of the stewardship team here at Rookery Bay. Uh, before I begin, I just wanted to apologize. Uh, it turns out Morgan and I are in the middle of a woodpecker turf war. There's a woodpecker nest tree behind me and a couple of groups of woodpeckers have been fighting over it. So if you start hearing some bird noises, um, I apologize. I'll, I'll, I'll try to talk over that. But um, anyways, I'm, I'm out here in our coastal scrub habitat to talk to you about a couple neat plants that we have. So a part of our mission here at Rookery Bay is to conserve and protect our native wildlife and our native plants. And so we've recently been teaming up with the Naples Botanical Garden to collect seed from some of our rare plant species. That way, if something would happen out here in the field, say a catastrophic wildfire or a really bad hurricane, came, we would have those seeds in an offsite location that we could plant back out here in the field. So we've been collecting seed from a lot of different plant species, but there are two plants that I really wanted to talk to you a bit about today. So the first one is right down here. I mean, this is yellow milkwort. The scientific name is Polygala rugelii. And it's called milkwort because the ancient Greeks thought that, um, that these types of plants would increase milk production in cows. Now, I'm not sure how accurate it is, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, the, these are a very, very pretty flower. Um, we have a couple species of milkwort here in the reserve. Uh, like I said, this is yellow milkwort. And yellow milkwort is really interesting in that it's endemic to peninsular Florida. Now, endemic just means it's native to a certain place and not native to anywhere else. So this is a, a fairly uncommon species. Um, Florida is the only place in the world where it's found. Uh, very, very pretty plant. <clears throat> Now, uh, we've been collecting seed. We've also been collecting some seed from a very closely related species called candy root, um, or Polygala nana is the scientific name. 
and it's called candy root because the the roots actually taste like licorice if you chew them. Um, now, I, I don't recommend that you go out in the field and, and start start eating plants. Um, Jared's a professional. Yeah. Please, please don't do that. There are some plants out here that uh, that can do really bad things to your body. But um, it's both both of these species, the yellow milkwort and the candy root, are really neat plants that uh, we really hope to protect and um, and really hope to to continue collecting seed from. So there's another plant species. Uh, we're gonna head over that way. It's not too far away. <laughs> So, as Dita said, Rookery Bay is a big place, 110,000 acres, and it's, it's a lot of land to cover, a lot of different habitats to, to survey for these rare plants. <laughs> so, we've been focusing our efforts on our coastal uplands. So, places like dune habitat or coastal strand, which is kind of like dune, but with some more shrubs, uh, maritime hammock. Whoa, Whoa. We, we had a lizard fight. Sorry to interrupt, Jared. <laughs> what were those? Uh, I don't know. I didn't get a good look. They, they, they kind of looked like a stink of some kind. Yeah. Like maybe five, five lines. Woo, that oh, was so. aggressive. Yeah, for, for the woodpeckers, now the lizards. Uh, it, it seems like everyone is, is this fighting is out here. This is quite the unique place, I'll tell you. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, let's see. I think we're back over this way. All yeah, right. here we go. So anyways, uh, we've been focusing on our coastal uplands, which includes coastal scrub like this. And scrub is a really high habitat, really dry habitat, dominated by scrubby oaks and palmettos. So uh, here's, here's another plant I wanted to point out. So we have the plant growing here, and then I was able to found a couple of flowers um, in a different location. And so I brought them over here. They're sitting in some water. Very pretty yellow flower. <clears throat> So this plant is called partridge pea, and it's called partridge pea because the seed pods are an important food for bobwhite quail, or partridges as they're sometimes called. Now partridge pea is a bit more widespread than the yellow milkwort. Uh, it's found over a big chunk of eastern North America and southern Canada, <clears throat> but it's a really unique species in that it actually adds nutrients to the, to the soil. <laughs> So partridge pea is in the pea or bean family, just like your, like your uh, string be beans that you buy in the store. And a lot of members of this family can, can take nitrogen from the atmosphere and convert it into a type of nitrogen that they can use. So um, in the atmosphere, there's nitrogen gas and it's, it's all over the place, but plants and animals really can't use it. In, in order for a plant or animal to use it, it has to be converted from atmospheric nitrogen to ammonia. <clears throat> now, this plant itself can't, can't do it on, on its own. It needs some help. So the partridge pea has a symbiotic relationship with some bacteria. These bacteria live in the root nodules of this plant the partridge pea supplies that, those bacteria with nutrient, nutrients, and in return, those bacteria take atmospheric nitrogen, turn it into ammonia that this plant can now use. And partridge pea is an annual plant, which means it dies back every year. And so when this plant dies, all the excess nitrogen it has taken in from, from, this back, from these bacteria return to the soil and in turn, other plants can use that nitrogen. And that's very important up here in the scrub because I don't know if you can see, but the soil is just sand. Uh, not, a lot of, not a lot of nutrients, not a lot of water. So a lot of plants have to be uh, very adaptive and, uh, and, and, and unique to survive up here. So partridge pea, another great species. <clears throat> now, um, there are a ton of other plants up here that I really would have liked to talk to you about, but we, we just don't have the time. Um, but wanted to thank you. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those after um, at the end of the presentation. Thank you so much, Jared. I did not realize how crucial some of these native plants are to the rest of our plant communities here in our upland scrub. So thank you. All right, I am going to turn it back over to our team at the ELC. Wow, I don't know how you guys feel, but I feel like we got bang for our buck this morning. We learned so much uh, and it's just going to keep going. So 
ELC team, take it away. All right, thank you plant cam. It's awesome to see what it's like out there in the field where it's hot and buggy as I sit in my office that's air conditioned. <laughs> um, just a refresher on where we are on this map. So we just saw the turtle cam. We just saw the plant cam. And I wanted to tell you that that's not all. <laughs> So if we can go to the next slide, Dita, I wanted to let you all know that we are open after 14 months of being closed, the Environmental Learning Center is open. So we hope that in addition to joining us virtually, you come on and see us. We're located in Naples at 300 Tower Road, and I'll be putting our website in the um, chat box in just a second. So if you are far away, please continue to join us virtually. But if you are in Naples, join us virtually and in person. Now, one thing to note, we did just reopen Monday through Friday. However, Monday is a holiday. So you'll have to see us starting next Tuesday. Next slide, Dita. Okay, so I mentioned that we have other virtual opportunities. So this summer, we want you to continue doing our excursions live from the field. So our summer lineup is so great. In fact, I'm going to email it to you right after this presentation ends. But we hope you'll join us to meet the mangroves and see the seagrass and browse the boardwalk and meander the mud flats. We are going to rediscover Rookery Bay and take you with us. This time, instead of going to behind the scenes sites like we have been all spring, we are going to places that you can go to as well. So we'll tell you how to get there and what to expect. So we hope you'll join us for that. And this, as all of our excursions are, is recorded. And the link will be sent to you in your thank you for attending email. So you can join us on all of the excursions again and again and see the ones that you may have missed. Other programs we have coming up are our guided boat and kayak tours. Those are in person. And two more virtual opportunities is trivia time, which is really fun. So the Rookery Bay education team will be using Mentimeter, where you guys will be able to play along, and there might even be prizes. And we also have our Break with the Birds program, which is our new lecture series. We're focusing on turns this summer, and we hope that you'll join us for our four-part series. So that's all I have, Dita. I think it might be time to go to questions. So go ahead and add your questions to the Q&A box or the chat box. And I also wanted to mention that this program, when the program ends, there will be a survey that pops up on your screen. And that's really important for us to know where you're located. We have to report the numbers to the bean counters. And it's hard to know where you are when we can't see you. So we hope that you'll answer your city and state and how many people you're watching with, as well as if you enjoy the program and if you have any ideas for future programs. So please fill out your survey. And I think we're gonna go to the questions now. So we'll welcome back the panel and Dita will moderate to see your questions being answered. Don't forget to vote for your favorites. All right, so it looks like we have some very intrigued uh, participants. So I love all your questions questions. And I believe, Steve, you answered the first one, but let's get a live answer just in case. Um, we have some questions on the camera, like the specific model of the camera that we use in the reserve. Well, we use um, the Brownings, which are a little cheaper, and we use some of the Reconyx cameras, the Hyperfire 2, which are a little more expensive, but they're more durable. So the Brownings, we use uh, the Spec Ops and um, we use the Strike Force. But um, there's a beautiful website, um, trailcam.pro, and they got all the different models and they test all the cameras and their tech staff is really helpful. So if you have any other questions, uh, I, I advise you to check out that website and um, they have the different... Um, variations of what you want to use the camera for and what are your best trail cams for that. Um, in our area, sometimes if they're out in the woods all by themselves, they're okay. But as soon as they get closer to development, sometimes they get vandalized or stolen. So that's why we try to use the cheaper cameras for those areas and the more expensive ones 
in the more remote areas. And we even come up with, um, you know, they have security boxes with Python locks. And, um, and I made a security post of it's a wooden post with some rebar dowels in the bottom sticking out in um, different increments. Um, feel free to email me if um, anybody's interested in some of the, um, the more secure ways that we put the cameras out. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Um, this is one definitely for you, Steve, while we wait, I hope our field cameras are still with us because there are some targeted questions for them. Um, but Steve, why do bears and other animals try to get the turtle eggs? And why are they attracted to that area? Well, obviously, um, they're, they're food, but um, their noses, they smell the eggs or they smell the rotten predated eggs that were already eaten or half eaten from somebody else. So, um, you know, wild animals, and we've had on a specific area, two or three cameras. And, and so I've seen the same animal stop at all three of the cameras. So they they're just foraging around looking for food or anything to eat. So I think the smell is the first thing that attracts them. Taking advantage of free food, I guess. Yeah. Now this goes to all three of our groups. So I think Sarah, I saw you guys on, um, what is the coolest thing you've seen in the field? Um, I think we're good. Oh. Uh, well, every day is different, so that's what makes being out here on the water so special. Uh, just yesterday, we saw a group of manatees um, in the middle of their mating ritual, so that's happening this time of year. But uh, every now and then, we'll see uh, big eagle rays jumping up out of the water, dolphins, um, turtles popping up as well, lots Sharks. of sharks we saw a hammerhead a couple weeks ago uh so you just never know what you're gonna see so that makes every day uh special all right what about jared and morgan what do you think that's that, that's a good question um let's see i've once in a while I'll, I'll come across a bear um once or twice i've, I've come across uh alligator or, or a crocodile and that's that's always neat it's a little scary but <laughs> a little neat um and I, I still have yet to see a panther, but I would love one of these days to come across a panther up here in, uh, in the scrub. So a lot of different animals that we have out here and uh, it's just, uh, just luck, I guess, where you, uh, where you come across them. And what's your verdict, Steve, for one of the more, the coolest or rarest animals you've seen? Well, I saw, I saw a crocodile and an alligator in a fight which must have lasted all day and the alligator won and was chewing on the carcass for like two or three days. And uh, I saw a bald eagle. I saw an osprey come down and grab a mullet out of, out of the bay. And then as it was flying away, a bald eagle came in at like Mark four and at the last minute, flapped his wings so we like stopped right in front of the 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 osprey and the osprey freaked out and dropped his fish and flew away and the eagle made a circle and picked the fish up and flew away with it that's sick <laughs> oh wow um turtle cam what is the development in the distance where you guys are right now um, it's uh, Marco Island. So we are just at the southern um, edge of Marco Island right here that the reserve surrounds. Awesome. Oh, and I then with a fish flying with a sheep head. Oh my gosh. It was too fast. I couldn't get the camera on it. That was for you, Steve. <laughs> uh, Jared and Morgan, a couple of questions on plants. They kind of go together. So one is, can you eat partridge pea? Can people? And then the second is in regards to how that partridge pea is beneficial, putting nitrogen in the sand. So since it's sandy, are there plants that grow there or how much diversity do you actually have with it being so sandy? 
Yeah, so I guess uh, for the first question, I'm not I'm not entirely sure if you can eat partridge pea. Uh, certain birds eat quite a bit of it, but um, you know, us humans we have a different different type of body, a different uh, metabolic system. So I'm not sure I'm not sure on that. Um, personally, I wouldn't try it <laughs> unless you know for sure that it that is edible. For some reason, Jared, I trust your opinion. <laughs> I trust that. Yeah. Well, well, there are plenty of other plants up here that are edible. And um, actually, you can kind of use that as a segue into the next question. So um, you can see kind of behind me and around me, there are quite a few plants growing up here in the scrub. Um, <clears throat> some plants that actually produce edible fruit, like this one right here. This is hog plum. And um, this one doesn't have any fruit on it, but it does produce nice little yellow uh, plum, plum type fruits. They are delicious. They are delicious. There's shiny blueberry, which grows up here. Taste I agree, they're delicious. Yeah, they're delicious. Uh, gopher apple, another uh, another really neat plant. Uh, it actually, the, the, the fruit actually tastes like grape soda. It, it is the strangest. <laughs> that taste, is crazy. Uh, the, the, the strangest tasting fruit I've ever eaten. But yeah, um, even though the scrub is kind of a harsh and in, inhospitable habitat, a lot of plants actually do quite well up here. And there are there are quite a few plant species that only grow up here in the scrub. So even though it's difficult to live and grow up here, um, so, some make it work. All right, and I know um, all three of you, Sarah, Jared, and Steve, you have spent some time you know, working with the wildlife cameras, looking at all this different diversity we have in the reserve. How often would you say we see the big cats, bobcats and panthers? Is it a common thing, rare? Um. I think it's a pretty common thing at Rookery Bay. Um, you know, the 110,000 acres, we don't have cameras all the way there, but, you know, Shell Island Road and around the Bathy property, which is up um, another area. Um, we, at one time, we had three or four panthers in Rookery Bay area at the same time, which is kind of, um, there's a theory that, the younger ones are being pushed out of the, the other areas in Collier County because the males have like a 90 mile territory. And if they find another male within that territory, they'll have a fight. So we, there's a theory that some of the younger immature animals are starting to come into Rookery Bay. And uh, so um, it's fairly common. It's fairly common. And I think Morgan, you had a kind of a surprise view of a bobcat, right? Oh yes, we did. Just before we opened the learning center, uh, Sarah and I were out on our observation bridge enjoying the breeze and the views. And we look over and we saw a bobcat swimming across Henderson Creek right before our eyes. We couldn't believe it. Uh, it was so cool, but we do have cameras set up behind the learning center also, and we've caught everything from wild turkey, panther, bobcat, bear. I think the bear tried to steal the camera at one point. It was crazy. Um, but yeah, you never know what you'll see out here. All right. Yeah, what, about, what about out here, Sarah? Uh, yeah, so Steve was around back in, back in the day uh, when there was a collared panther that actually swam out to one of our barrier islands and they nicknamed him Beach Boy. I know Steve <laughs> wants to talk about Beach Boy at all. Yeah, Beach Boy actually um, came through the Picayune, through Fiddler's Creek, Rookery Bay, to Hall Bay, swam out to Keewaden Island, went all the way to the northern end of Keewaden Island, almost by Port Royal, but didn't swim across Gordon Pass came all the way back down Key Waden, all the way back through Rookery Bay into Hall Bay again, and then back into the Picayune. So that's a pretty good journey. All right, well, I am so amazed. There are so many good questions that I, you know, we can barely keep up with them. Um, and one big question was how we can help protect all this biodiversity that is in the reserve. 
So I'm sure some of you have heard that pack it in, pack it out. If you are going exploring in a remote area, you know, bring your trash with you, stay on paths so you're not destroying some of that habitat that's in the area. And then also, you know, um, keep an eye on what kind of monitoring efforts are going on and how you can help. So if you do have an invasive plant or an invasive plant or pet that you have, you know, don't release it. So there's a lot of little ways you can help uh, protect this wonderful uh, diversity all around us. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us in the remote audience and for the panel for being out in the field and taking us along. So it's been a real pleasure. We look forward to our summer series and we'll go ahead and end the webinar now so you can carry on with your day and don't forget to fill out our survey. We'll see you all next time. Come visit us at the ELC. Bye. Bye from the plant cam. <laughs> Bye from the turtle cam. Woo. Bye.